Keep your heads lifted up, beautiful family in Jesus Christ. And he's coming for everyone that has the Holy Spirit and everyone that holds on to their faith in him and what he did for you. And here's the verse of the day. And it's Proverbs 3, 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And just so you know, family, I love everyone, even my enemies. Even if you believe in OSAS, even though it's a lie, I still love you. OSAS is not in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're once saved, always saved. That phraseology was made by man. The truth is that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Some brothers and sisters are highly confused. I completely believe in the finished work on the cross. I know that it is finished. I know that we are saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's 100% true. You are saved by grace through faith. But if you lose your faith, you will not be saved. The big difference between me and OSAS believers is I believe all of the word. And I know all of the word is true. I follow the word, Jesus Christ. I don't follow OSAS. OSAS doesn't believe all of the word. They don't believe that the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, the last days, some shall depart from the faith. Well, you can't depart from something that you don't believe in. You have to believe in Jesus Christ to depart from the faith. I know that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I know that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know that that's true. I also know that the word does not say that you cannot walk away from Jesus Christ. That you cannot separate yourself from Jesus Christ. Because you can. Many have. I know for a fact that all of the prophecy will be fulfilled. And in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And I know nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hand, but you can depart from the Father's hand. You can reject our Father, and many Christians have. It's a fact. The word is true. And Jesus Christ said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And the word says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. It doesn't matter what I think or what you think or what anyone thinks. What matters and what the truth is, is the word of God. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. I know for a fact that if you keep your faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, also known as Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And I also know for a fact that if you lose your faith and reject Jesus Christ, and if you take the mark of the beast or worship the beast, you will not be saved. You will go to hell. That proves that there is no once saved, always saved. The word debunks Osas. And if you blaspheme the Ruash HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. And if you don't repent from adultery and you don't turn from your deeds of adultery, you will be cast into great tribulation. 
OSAS does not change the word of God. OSAS is a lie. OSAS is an abbreviation for once saved, you're always saved. That means you cannot depart from your faith. You cannot lose your salvation is what OSAS means. But it's a lie. The truth is in the latter times, right now, in the last days is what the latter times is, some shall depart from the faith. OSAS does not believe that. It's the word of God. It's right before your eyes. I'm not taking the word out of context. I'm reading it verbatim. Again, I believe all of the word. People that believe in OSAS do not believe all of the word. They do not believe Hebrews. They do not believe what else Paul said. They do not want to believe what Jesus Christ said. Jesus Christ said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Jesus Christ says that the devil will snatch the word out of your heart. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, Remember, in the latter times, some shall depart from faith. Remember, it is impossible if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and to put him to an open shame. It is impossible to be made partakers of the Holy Ghost and taste the good word of God if they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance. If you fall away and depart from the faith in Jesus Christ and what he did, you are not always saved. We are saved by grace through faith. Without faith, there is no grace. You reject Jesus Christ? There is no grace. All glory to our Father. In the name above every name, Jesus Christ. I'm in the word every day because faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. That's how we increase our faith. Again, I believe all of the word. OSAS does not. OSAS does not believe Jesus Christ the word. Jesus Christ said, they on the rock are they, which when they hear, they receive the word with joy, and they have no root, which for a while believe. Uh, did you hear that, believers? They believe, but in the time of temptation, they fall away. They depart from the faith. Again, I believe all of the word. OSAS does not. OSAS does not carry the cross. OSAS does not fear God. OSAS does not believe. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, once saved, always saved is not written. It's not in the word of God. It's not in your holy Bible. It was made up by man and abbreviated into this catchy little OSAS title to please people and make them feel comfortable so they could go back into the world and sin. It's the devil lying to you, just like he lied to Eve. He's the deceiver. OSAS claims that they cannot fall away. They're sealed. Once saved, always saved. But the red word says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee, 
quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Do not follow people. Follow the word, Jesus Christ. I hear people are saying that you can kill yourself and you'll still go to heaven. Follow Jesus Christ, not Judas. Judas killed himself. Jesus Christ said, the son of man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man whom the son of man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. It would have been better if Judas was never born. Ask yourself why. Because he betrayed Jesus Christ and then killed himself. Obviously, it would have been better for him that he would never be born because he went to hell. Do not let Osas entice you to sin. The word is extremely clear. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. So do what Jesus Christ said. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. Pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. And he said the signs would be in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they are. And all glory to our Father in Jesus Christ's name. He has been showing me tons of signs. And God willing, I'll go over them with you in my next video, if we're still here. But right now, I'll give you one that's gigantinormous. And it's what they call an asteroid, a minor planet, what I call a star. And it's right there next to the eclipse on 4-8. And it's Wilkerson, like David Wilkerson, right next to Mercury that people say is the messenger. Well, here's the message. But whether they want to hear it or not, the Lord always sends forth watchmen to warn. He always does. He never does anything till he warns. The gospel of accommodation. Now, to accommodate means to adapt. It means to make suitable or acceptable. It also means to adjust, to make something very convenient. It means to yield to the desires of others to placate them. Now, you put that together, and I'm talking about a gospel that's been invented in hell and is now being propagated all over the United States. It's a suitable, acceptable, convenient a gospel that has yielded to the desires and the weakness of sinful men. I call it the gospel of accommodation because it's adapting and adjusting the gospel uh, to appease and attract sinners. This gospel of accommodation is primarily an American cultural invention. It's a non-confronting, convenient gospel, adapted. It is spoon-fed to the congregation by... Uh, skits, humorous skits and drama, short, non-abrasive, 20-minute messages. It sounds good. What they say sounds very good. It sounds spiritual in its goals. It sounds like Jesus is the central theme. I am here to remind you that Paul the Apostle warned of the coming of another gospel which we have not preached. He said there is coming another gospel that's going to preach another Jesus. You'll hear his name. It'll sound sweet, but it's not the Jesus that I preach, Paul said. It's not the true Jesus. Paul goes on, or Paul was amazed. He said that you were so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. Folks, listen to me. There is in the land right now with thousands of people sitting under another gospel, another Jesus. Paul goes to warn the church. It's really not another gospel, but it's a perversion of the gospel of Christ, which is really not another, Paul said, but there'll be some that trouble you and pervert or change the gospel of Christ. He said, they're going to change it. They're going to accommodate the sinner. 
They're going to accommodate their pleasures. They're going to accommodate all of their needs. And they're going to design a gospel with their own Christ, with their own doctrine. And then this awful warning from Paul. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you but that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Folks, I didn't say that. The Apostle Paul said it. If anybody preached another gospel, what you've heard, if anyone preached anything but the crucified Christ, if anyone preached anything that appeases man in his sin, that's not the gospel you heard from me, Paul said, and anyone preaches another, let him be accursed. When men become dissatisfied with preaching a simple gospel, and they get bored and they're not praying, and they're not seeking God, and they get their eyes on people and numbers, and, and, and they want to be judged like everybody else, I want to be a success. Listen, if you find the right formula, it said you can be a success in any field of endeavor possible. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Some young men have come up with the formula how to build a church. A formula. This formula based accommodating gospel is contrary to everything in the scripture. I read in Acts 13 of a gathering of godly men in Antioch. They were out going to send out some young ministers to establish churches and preach the gospel to a darkened world. How does God go about building churches? How does the Holy Ghost work? Scripture said they gathered and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. This was their planning session. Worship, fasting, waiting on the Lord for direction till the Holy Ghost comes and tells them exactly what to do. Number two, they prayed. No strategizing, no networking. No one made a step until the Holy Ghost said, this is the way, walk in it. And then when the Holy Ghost spoke, they laid hands on it and sent them out. The Bible says, under the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You see, Paul had lived his whole religious life under religious formulas. He saw he'd lived with these man-made schemes. He, he had seen teachings that accommodated the weaknesses and the sinfulness of backslidden Jews. He'd had his stomach full of it. He said, I have nothing to do with that. It attracts the multitudes, yes. But he said, one day Jesus came and revealed himself in me. And Paul put all of the formulas aside as dung. As garbage. Paul, by his own confession, said, I'm determined to go forth to fully preach the gospel of Christ in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. And unless the gospel is preached in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost, it's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. But Paul said there will be no accommodating. Let them call our preaching foolishness. Let them say it's out of date, that it's not contemporary. He said, I've determined to preach nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This other gospel accommodates the sinner in many ways. But there are three areas of accommodation that the Holy Ghost grieves over. And this, I felt the grief of God on these three areas of accommodation where people have, where ministers are changing the gospel to suit the crowd. Number one, the accommodation of man's love for pleasure. Know this also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And the Greek word for pleasure here is sensuality, lust, voluptuousness. In other words, exciting, gratifying, sensual pleasures. And all folks, here's the danger. Those who are established these seeker-friendly churches, they, and they're prepared to accommodate the crowd. The Bible says they're going to have to not preach. It, it's very, very clear they cannot preach against sensuality because the apostle says they're going to be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They're going to love their sports. They're going to love their X-rated movies. They're going to love their videos. They're going to love their, their uh, computer sex. They're going to love these sensuous things. The Bible says they're going to love these things. They're going to come into the house of God. And if you're going to accommodate them, you're not going to touch one of their lusts. They're not going to say one word about it. Oh, they're going to be pastors on judgment day. Hear these awful words, son of man, I made thee a watchman. You were to hear the word at my mouth and give them warnings from me. You were to tell the wicked thou shalt surely die. 
and you gave them no warning, nor spake to warn the wicked from the wicked ways to save their lives. These same wicked men will die. These same wicked men did die in their sins, but now their blood I require from your hands. Accommodation number two, the accommodation of modern man's aversion to self-denial. Number three, the accommodating of men's offense of the cross. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Paul spoke of the offense of the cross. And we're coming now to the heart of why God hates this new doctrine, this new movement in America. This is why God hates it, rejects it outright, and why he's cursed it, and why God will put anathema on any preacher who embraces it. God demands more than coming to the cross. He demands going through the cross. And that's the offense, that it takes everything a man has and owns and trusts in. You see, the offense of the, the, the sinner is most willing to come to the cross and kneel before it. He's willing to take the claims by a single confession of faith and, and just say, yes, Lord, I believe. He wants all of the benefits of the cross. He wants to believe that Christ is sacrificed, yes, and covered all his sins. Now, folks, that's being preached. The cross, though all the phraseology is there, it's sweetly talked about the cross. Come to the cross of Jesus and be forgiven. There's not one word about saying going on with Christ into the tomb and to die. There's not a word about going down into the grave and coming out resurrected in newness of life. It's coming to the cross, kneel, say a prayer, and go back to your sins. Go back and no one say a word. You take it by faith. You are now the righteousness of Christ. No dying to sin, no being resurrected in newness of life. Now that's the offense of the cross. That you go all the way when you come. He demands full obedience. He demands everything we have. And I'm afraid a majority of people who claim to be Christians and saved in these last days have been to the cross, but they've never been through the cross. They've never been buried with Christ. Paul said, I died with Christ. I was raised with Christ. I was crucified with Christ. I not only came to his cross, I picked up my cross, I went through with him. We have another gospel now that tells men what the cross did for him, but not what it wants to take him to. The gospel, folks, is not just forgiveness, it's not simply believe and get heaven someday. It's not only the saving of the soul, it's the saving of the body. This flesh. God says, I want your flesh, I want your body as a living sacrifice. And that's the preaching of the cross. Folks, I don't care if, they, if somebody could gather a crowd of 100,000 people in a stadium and they could turn to me and say, Pastor Dave, you're wrong. Look, 100,000 people that have come through my secret friendly church and here they are. They're all believers now. And folks, I want you to know something. If those 100,000 people have not been given the full gospel of Jesus Christ, has not been preached fully, if the claims of the cross have not been laid there, and if they've been coddled and comforted in their sins, that hundred thousand have been made twice a child of hell than ever before there and worse shape because the Bible says they can come now and hear the words of the curse even and bless himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart and add drunkenness to thirst. Because a false peace has been given to them that they can live in their sins. Never be rebuked, never be reproved, never see the claims of the cross. That he not only died to deliver man from, from the thought of sin and the idea of sin, but the dominion of sin in his own life. If the preaching of grace doesn't have as its goal righteousness, it's another gospel. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Behold this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourself, indignation, fear, yea, what vehement desire and zeal, what revenge. In all things you have proved yourself to be clear in this matter. 
And Paul warns if there's not that kind of preaching, many will walk, of whom I told you often and now tell you even weeping. They are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Folks, we started down on Crack Alley on 41st Street in that ragtag theater. And from the first time I stood in the pulpit, I preached repentance. I preached the cross. I said, I'm not, we are not here to comfort you in your sins. We're here to confront you in your sins and to believe that there's a Savior who'll deliver you. And they, the experts tell us that won't work. People don't want that.